Hey, well, good morning. Welcome to Valley View. We're so glad you've chosen this to be the place that you worship today. I want to remind you that um, if you are, if you are um, a visitor, or I guess that's not a reminder. I guess if you're visiting us, just want to let you know that we have a gift for you, um, and we want to make sure that you get that. And so uh, we, uh, we want you to come and see us and let us know it's your first time with us, or maybe first time in a while. Um, also just want to um, ask you to begin to prepare your hearts for what the Lord wants to do here in our midst. Um, we come and we get to visit and we get to be with friends, but uh, we know that um, in the midst of all that we do, our hope is the Lord would reveal himself to us. And with that said, I want to read from Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not, do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your namesake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Father, we come before you this morning saying that, that all the trials and all the difficulties, all that we know of this world that might uh, ensnare us or entrap us, Lord, we want to lay those things aside and forget those things. We want to rather say, Lord, we want to be caught up in the net of your steadfast love. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives and what you're going to do even this morning as you reveal yourself to us in the worship time and in, in the in the exposition of the word, Lord, and we trust you to be with us. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, at this time, why don't you go ahead and stand up and greet each other and tell them you're happy, tell someone you're happy to see them this morning. Well, hey there, as you begin to make your way back to your seat, we have a video to show you about camp. So just uh, make your way there and you'll enjoy this video and give you some more information. We were born for greater things. We were born to chase your dreams. Come, my Lord, awaken holy fire. We are turning from our sin. We are praying one.
Okay, yeah, so um, if you're interested in going to family camp or teen camp or kids camp, make sure you see the pastor in charge <laughs> of those various ages, I suppose. So, um, or you can just see any pastor if you need some information on that. Uh, but also, I just want to remind you that somewhere, somewhere in this room, there is a teen camp sponsor, right, Jose? There's a teen camp sponsor somewhere in this room. So I know the Lord is just speaking to your heart uh, this morning and, and the last few weeks, and I, I know you're dying to go. Would you come see myself or, or Jose? Maybe Jose's best, uh, but, but uh, don't, don't let that call go unanswered, okay? Um, I don't want you to forget, I'm going to children's camp, okay? So I, I can't go to teen camp and children's camp, but we, we actually do need a gal uh, for the teens. Anyway, um, a gal, yeah. Uh, so I, I neglected to announce this last week, and, and I need to do this double, double time. Okay, so this is a, 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 a two-fold announcement. or well, not two-fold, but it's, it's doubly serious. You need to listen twice as good as you normally listen to announcements. The women's tea uh, is, is coming up, afternoon tea. It's May 13th, um, and it's from 3 to 5 p.m. And, and so you need to... Make sure that you make that you mark that in your calendar. This is open to any any lady that uh, wants to come, and and definitely you bring people. Is there a registration for that? No, just come. They will be. Re you can don't worry. You can bring people. Uh, we we will make sure there's enough tea to go around, uh, tea and crumpets. I don't know. Um, what's what's that? Punch. Great. Um, well, we're calling it afternoon tea anyway, but uh, punch. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, so uh, youth are having a, an event. They're having ice cream. Uh, we want you to bring your friends and have a good time. That's uh, May 19th at 6 p.m. And then uh, we're getting ready for um, celebrating some, some graduates in our church. Um, so we're going to have a graduation Sunday, um, kind of just a little bit of a recognition um, uh, on the 21st of May. Uh, that's coming up here in a few weeks, but um, you will get more info on that, I'm sure. Or you're probably thinking, who are our graduates? Well, you'll find out. Um, anyway, with, with all that said, I think we're finished, and we're ready to begin to worship. So I just want to ask you, um, go ahead and stand um, and, and be ready for what the Lord wants to tell you this morning.
working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are we make it, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are.
Yes, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. Thank you because even when we don't see, you're there. And you're working every single day. Every breath that we take is because of you, Lord. And we just thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. Lord, help us prepare our heart as Pastor Jill is coming over to this morning and give us the word. Please, Lord, help us understand your word and apply it to our lives. Open up our minds, open up our hearts, and just pour on your word into our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. You get to have the children's pastor preach to everyone today. So, uh, <laughs> and I absolutely love our family worship day. At the beginning of every month, we get to worship God together across all generations. And it's beautiful because that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Everyone worshiping together, all languages, all ages, and I was just moved by the Spirit this morning. Um, but I just want to thank you for allowing me to have this time uh, to bring God's Word to you. I really feel like this is what God has laid on my heart. And um, through our worship this morning, I know God has something to say to each one of us today. So I just pray that we open our hearts to hear that. Um, since January, the kids have been meeting in the children's ministry room for the whole length of our service. Um, we're doing a lot of what you're doing in here every Sunday morning. We worship through song. Uh, we have a meet and greet time. We go and say hi to our neighbors. Uh, we are learning scripture and we're learning God's word and what that means for our lives. Um, but we're also having snacks and worshiping together through fellowship around tables. And we're also worshiping through play. I know that sounds like a silly thing, but it actually teaches us how to be kind to our peers, how to be loving to those that are around us. So we are having a great time. And I, since I have this opportunity, just wanna say thank you for investing in the children that are attending this church. Because of what we've been able to do in the back with renovating, um, we've been able to move into that space more. It's allowing us to grow, um, to have sections where we can make worship uh, a priority. And so I just wanna say thank you for letting us have that space uh, this morning. But um, as we move into our text today, I just, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever thought that your life was going in one direction and then God completely course corrected you? You can because I'm thinking this might be everyone, okay? We thought we had a plan and then God came and said, nope, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to do this instead. So for me, one of those times was in 1999, Kids are going to think that's so long ago. Um, at Nazarene Youth Conference, which our teens are going to get to go to this year in Tampa Bay. So I'm so excited for them. But God course corrected me at that conference. I had a plan. I was going to be a senior in high school. I wanted to be an x-ray technician. I had decided a university I was already going to. But at that conference, God called me into ministry. And I've never looked back. In our passage today, the disciples thought life was going one way. But Jesus is telling them something different than they expected. Now, it is family worship, and so I have invited Caitlin to come and read our scripture passage for us this morning. You can follow along in your Bible, or uh, the words are going to be up here on the screen behind us. All right, this is the word of the Lord. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Amen. John chapter 14, verses 5 and 7. Thank you, Caitlin. I appreciate that. Okay, so 
Imagine being one of the disciples who spent time with Jesus in person, okay? It would have been exhilarating witnessing Jesus heal people, the miracles that he performed, um, probably also exhausting. Think about all the traveling they did, mostly by foot or by boat, and possibly sometimes confusing. We know that Jesus spoke in parables and didn't always give the exact answer that the disciples were looking for. And even in our passage this morning, the disciples don't quite understand what Jesus is telling them. But being with Jesus was completely life-altering. Every one of the disciples that Jesus encountered had plans. Some of them were going to be fishermen. One was already a tax collector. But Jesus shows up, and he calls them to follow him. Their path and their course in life is changed forever. They follow Jesus. They're by his side. The Messiah has come, and they're there for it. But then Jesus is crucified. He dies, and their entire world is shattered. But then the best possible thing happens. Jesus raises from the dead. He's back. He's defeated death. And in our text, Jesus is showing himself. He's appeared to different groups of disciples, to different people after his resurrection. And this is one of those times after his resurrection, before his ascension to be with God the Father. And in our text this morning, he's explaining to Thomas and to Philip, uh, presumably other disciples that are with them at the time, that he's going away, but he's going to prepare a place for them to come and join him. Well, Thomas is obviously confused and asking, how, how do we get where Jesus is going? Because I don't know the way. Jesus just rose from the dead. They have him back in their presence. And now he's talking about going away again. And I'm sure they thought that he was going to be with them forever. He wasn't ever going away again. So Jesus is preparing them and letting them know that he is going to be with his father in heaven. But the disciples are just not getting it. So Jesus reassures him that he does know the way. And just as Jesus tells Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life, this is Jesus' word for us today too. Through Jesus, we have a way to be with God for all of eternity. So first Jesus says, I am the way. I love the last worship song that we just sang. Jesus is the way. He's the miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. Jesus is our mediator and speaks to God on our behalf. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. So we're going to look at John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, um, and this is what it says. The next day, John, the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that's Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Peter. So Jesus was called the Lamb of God by his cousin John the Baptist. We know John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for Jesus, for the Savior. And when John describes Jesus as the Lamb, he's telling everyone around him, there's something really special about Jesus. Jesus is there to be offered as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And we know in the Old Testament that the people of God would have to go to the temple or the place where God's presence was, and they'd have to offer sacrifices to God so that their sins could be forgiven. So God wanted his presence to remain with his people, his chosen people, but we all know that the people of God were rebellious, and they often made bad choices. So when you read through the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, you get a full accounting of which animals were sacrificed for which sins. 
Um, I'm not going to go into all of that because it's extensive and honestly kind of hard to keep track of all the things that were required. But a lamb was one of those animals that was often used in sacrifices. And the lamb would pay the price for a specific sin. The action was pleasing to God and God would forgive the person's sins. And God promised not to destroy Israel when they sinned against him. But the Israelites needed a system that could turn them away from sin. That it would pay their debt and it would cleanse and purify the community and the temple from sin. And allow them to stay in God's presence. So the symbolism of animal sacrifice in the Bible is a concrete expression of God's justice and his grace. And it reminded the Israelites of the serious nature of sin. It wasn't just a consequence for the individual, but it was a consequence for the whole community. And ultimately, these sacrifices showed the Israelites how much God wanted to stay in a covenant relationship with them. And he wanted them to be the kingdom of priests that he had called them to be. So when Jesus came, it was on purpose. He died on the cross, and it was the ultimate and the final sacrifice that was required. It took the place of all of our sins, the sins of all people. You know, praise God we don't have to bring our doves and our lambs and our bulls before God because we have Jesus Christ. We get to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is our mediator. So we have an advocate in Jesus Christ and a way to a relationship with God. When we sin, we go against God. When we struggle and we make bad choices, we get to go straight to Jesus Christ. We're given grace and forgiveness by humbling ourselves and admitting that we have done wrong. Jesus mediates on our behalf and God forgives us. So John reminds us in 1 John 4, 9 and 10, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loves us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Praise be to God. But secondly, Jesus reveals that he is the truth. Jesus is the true and life-giving way to God. Now, while he was on earth, Jesus' disciples learned the truth about God. Jesus spoke truth, and he taught about his heavenly Father. And as he taught, he questioned the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were also teaching about God. He wanted to make sure that everyone knew what was right and what was wrong. So John 1, 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And we know sometimes it fell on open ears. The truth was received and lives were transformed. People believed and they followed Jesus. Uh, one of those people that I think about is Zacchaeus. I think we might all know the story of Zacchaeus. Um, his life was completely turned around, completely changed when he came face to face with Christ. He was a corrupt tax collector. He cheated the Jewish people. But when Jesus knows his name and interacts with him in his own home, despite the whispers that are taking place right outside, Zacchaeus' life is transformed. He declares in Luke 19 to give half of his possessions to the poor and everyone that he's cheated, he's going to pay back four times the amount that he took from them. I imagine this was a huge sacrifice for Zacchaeus. The amount of money that he had taken from people and now that he's met Jesus Christ, he's saying, I'm going to give back more than I took. Um, the kids, we have been talking about Saul in Children's Church. Uh, I think we all know the story of Saul and how his life was absolutely transformed. But I just want to read his story from Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to be given at the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. 
as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men that were traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus, and for three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. So we skip down to verse 17 of that same chapter. Then Ananias went to the house, and he entered it. And when Saul was there, he placed his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he gained his strength, and Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. I imagine all those who had just been persecuted by Saul, and now he's coming to tell them about Jesus, they're thinking, this is a trick. I don't know what Paul is trying to do. Saul gets his name changed to Paul. But I can imagine they are slightly afraid. But what we know is that Paul's life was absolutely transformed after he meets Jesus Christ. He is changed, absolutely changed. Unfortunately, there were also people who didn't want to hear the the message that Jesus had. Jesus was chased away. Others walked away because they couldn't give up what they had for the truth. In Luke 18, we read about the rich young ruler, another story that many of us know. This man wanted to know what he had to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus tells him to sell everything that he has and follow him. But the young man walks away sad, and he chooses his wealth over Jesus. But we also know the Sadducees and the Pharisees were not concerned with keeping the law of, that Jesus was telling them about, but they were more concerned with keeping the law of Moses and following rituals than realizing who was standing right in their presence. They couldn't believe the truth that was standing right there. Jesus is the visible, tangible image of God. And he's the complete revelation of what God is like. The search for God, for truth, and for reality ends in Christ. All that God had spoken of and promised came through in Jesus. So I was doing a little bit of research, and I came across a a group of researchers uh, from the Jesus Film Project. They sat down. And they found 55 prophecies in the Old Testament that spoke of the coming Messiah. And then they also went and found 55 fulfillments of those prophecies in the New Testament. Now, I'm not saying only researchers can do that because you and I can sit down with our Bibles in front of us and we can find those same fulfillments. The truth of Jesus Christ. So these truths included the family lineage, the birth, the ministry and life, death and resurrection of Jesus. God had a plan from the beginning that included his rescue plan for all people. So finally, Jesus talks about how he is the life. And John shares Jesus' words many times throughout his book, throughout the entire book of John. John's pointing us to Jesus as the answer. You want to have life forever? This is how. So starting in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, many of us probably have this memorized, but in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. 
In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So we jump to chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 of John. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, talking to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus spent his time on earth teaching and healing, loving, spending time with people. A lot of times the people, the Sadducees and Pharisees, thought he should not be spending time with. And making sure people knew how much God loved them. Jesus was God in flesh, the promised Messiah. So who is Jesus? Guess what? If you know him, you know the Father. Jesus was God in flesh, the promised Messiah. He speaks on behalf of the Father. He does the work his Father puts him to. And he was the ultimate and final sacrifice so that we could have a relationship with God. Jesus is grace and truth. He is life, and through him, we get to have eternal life. We have an opportunity as believers and followers of Christ. And that opportunity is telling others this great news. The Jesus that we believe in that lets us have a relationship with the Father. In John 14, verses 12 and 14, 12 through 14, it says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to go to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. One of the reasons that I love working so much with kids is because of their faith. They are absolutely unashamed, and they believe in Jesus with all of their hearts. And Maybe I should or should not tell you this, but I know more about your family and your pets than you probably want me to through the prayer requests that kids bring up. They want to pray about everything and everyone, and I tell you, I want to be like them. I want to believe that we can go to the Father with anything. It says, ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Their hearts for the kids at their schools, their neighbors, their family members, some random person they met in the grocery store with their parents. They don't even know them, but they really want to pray for them. This is where our hearts should be, having faith like a child. Statistics show that most people come to believe in Christ as their personal Savior before the age of 17. Now, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but just out of curiosity, how many of you accepted Christ as a child before the age of 17? A good number of us, right? Now, whenever you come to make that belief in Jesus Christ, it's an amazing day. But what statistics are showing us is that most people come to follow Jesus as a child. And so I love that I get to work with kids and be reminded of their childlike faith, how much they believe in Jesus should be a testimony for all of us. I grew up in a Christian home, and I have gone to church my whole life. Sometimes I didn't have a choice. I was asked to go to church, and I went. But I remember deciding for myself at church camp right after fifth grade that I wanted to follow Jesus. It wasn't just something my parents were telling me about. But it was a choice that I was making to believe in and follow Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. And this may be a reason why I feel so strongly about church camp, um, a place where God chose to reach me. But I love getting to take the kids to camp. There is something about gathering together with your peers, hearing truth about Jesus Christ, 
and your life being absolutely transformed. Might also be why I'm so excited about our teens who get to go to NYC. This event, this, this time together with other teenagers, where they're spoken to in ways that make sense to them. God is going to change their lives. Are you praying to the way, the truth, and the life? Do you believe that you can do even greater things than Jesus? Are you praying in a way that glorifies God and lines up with his will? Or are you praying a little selfishly in a way to get something that you really want? Do you believe Jesus is who he claimed to be? I want to tell you this morning that we should be bold, that we should be courageous and absolutely unashamed of the gospel message. Jesus, who healed people, who performed miracles, who never sinned, is saying in this passage that you will do even greater things than he did while he was on earth. Do you believe it? Do you believe that his power is within you? And that you get to share that with absolutely every person that you're around? What path are you following this morning? Are you seeking after truth? Or are you going your own way? Who do you turn to in difficult times? Where are you getting your advice? God your creator wants a relationship with you, wants to spend time with you, wants you to bring your request to him. He wants to answer your prayers. And we have hope that he does. We have proof that he does. And we believe that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ has a relationship with God the Father. This morning we're going to be taking a communion in just a little bit. We believe that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior gets to come to the table, gets to partake in this time together. But as we're thinking about communion, I, I just want to leave you with these thoughts. I want you to think about these things. As the way, Jesus is our path to the Father. As the truth, he's the reality of all of God's promises. And as the life, he joins his divine life to ours, both now and eternally. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in all that he says that he is? The way, the truth, and the life? Who are you going to? Who are you spending the most time with? And are you sharing that good news with absolutely every person that you can? This is our task. This is our responsibility to tell others about the amazing God that we serve. I want to invite the, the praise team to come back up this morning. And we're going to go into a time of prayer. And after that, we will go into communion. But I just want us to take inventory this morning. Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Who is it that you're following? If it's not Christ, we need to pray. I want us to bow our heads this morning. I just want to give you a moment of quiet. Is there hurt in your life? Is there something that you need to petition to God and say, God, I cannot do this on my own and I need you.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with open hearts, open minds, open ears to hear the message that you have for us today. We truly believe that you are the way, that you took our sins upon you on that cross. You made the ultimate and final sacrifice for our sins. God, if there's something that's keeping us from a deeper relationship with you, reveal it to us. Draw us close to you. Reveal yourself to us. God, we believe that you are the truth. You are the promised Messiah that God foretold of in the Old Testament. That's why we believe the Old Testament is so important for us to see who God is and how he's pointing us to Jesus. And God, you are the life. When we believe in you and we have a relationship with you, we get to spend eternity praising you. Lord, if we, if anyone in here does not know you this morning, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. That they would draw close to you and accept you as their personal savior. Maybe some of us have been following you for a long time and we have just gotten stuck. God, give us a fresh anointing of your spirit today. Fill us and help us to move from this place changed and different, bold and courageous and wanting to tell absolutely every person we know that Jesus is the son of God. We get to follow him. He saves us and he changes us. And God, as we move into this time of communion, help us to remember what the table represents. God, we love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And it's in Jesus' name that we all pray together and we say, Amen. Jordan really made my job easy this morning. I spent part of the week, you know, kind of gathering what I wanted to say this morning about communion, but Jill covered it so gracefully and so good. I want to say this, though. Communion is one of the most intimate ways of worship, I think, that we have with God. I want to remind each of us, though, if we've accepted Christ, there's a chair at the table waiting for us. I like to think of a table that's as far as we can see from one end to the other, and knowing that there's a place there with us with Jesus. And the thing about it is, there's nothing that we've done to deserve that. Absolutely nothing that we've done to deserve that. It is through God's grace I was going to go into a, a few minutes of, of quiet time. I like a little bit of med meditation time, but we, we covered that a few minutes ago, so we don't need to do that. But I do want to do this, though. I'm trying to keep it together. On the night before Jesus handed himself over, and I want to make this perfectly clear. Jesus willingly handed himself over. He was at the, at the table with the biggest bunch of misfits, as Jill mentioned earlier, that you could possibly imagine. But that was intentional so that we knew that we, we would know that we, we had a place there as well. But Jesus took the bread and he raised it and he gave thanks for it broke it and he told the disciples he said this is my body that has been broken for you 
take it and eat and do it in remembrance of me. Now, they didn't know what was coming. They couldn't foresee what was coming. In fact, all of them fled, but a few seeing their Savior, the one they loved, hanging on a cross, the body being broken. The next thing, Jesus took the juice wine and he raised it and he gave thanks to it and he told them he says take it and drink but do it in remembrance of me for the forgiveness of sin forgiveness of our sins wow Jesus' blood shed for us for forgiveness of sin so therefore we're all welcome to the table we're all welcome to come to the table So this morning, I guess, Gavin and I, Gavin, would you please come? And we'll make two lines. Y'all come and partake in the communion. it. 
to show us the way when we can't figure out the way for ourselves. You're enough. You're not just worthy of our of our love and appreciation and affection, Lord, but you're enough to fix the broken parts of this world, including us. We ask that you would continue to be a light in us. We ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us. And that when we feel lost or alone, that we would seek you. When we feel out of place or or not meant for, for this world, Lord, that we would find comfort and refuge in the church and in your arms. Lord, help us to be your people. Let us represent you well. We know that this is possible through your sacrifice that we remember here with communion this morning. You're enough, and you make us enough. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. God bless you. Go in his peace and know you are enough. Amen.